Alright. So today we're going to be talking about everything else. Uh, about a generic discussion of Pulsar and possibly getting into seeing that the story is a bit more complicated um, than we sort of led on so far. But by and large, the general properties can be described um, in terms of so far the things that we've told you. So let's go ahead and look at what happens um, with some of these pulsars. And the first thing that I want to do is quickly revisit a few of the topics and make sure that we're all on the same page with respect to those. So remember that one of the most exciting things about these kind of stars is that they can become these really accurate clocks which pulse. And that's coming from these accelerated particles looping around um, and creating a beam effect of radiation, which then sweeps over the observer every time that neutron star rotates. So um, where are the accelerated particles coming from? Why are you getting that beaming? Yeah, so the dominant thing that's uh, sort of really important is the magnetic field. And in particular, um, what's going on, right? We told this story that we get the synchrotron emission coming from the flash that has the magnetic field. Um, and these charged particles accelerating around. And we can see that in the spectrum for, say, the Crab Nebula. Uh, depending on what wavelengths you observe, you get different portions of this synchrotron spectrum. But here is what a, a, a synchrotron spectrum does look like. Um, and you can see sort of the luminosity coming out, something like 10 to the 37th ergs per second as a peak intensity. Um, so these guys are very bright beams swooping over, um, and we can certainly uh, sort of there's a line which is the theoretical synchrotron spectrum, and you can see that all the data um, sort of nicely line up there for observations in optical soft X-rays um, and and onwards. So here's the radio. You can fit slopes to each just to sort of get a sense of what's going on and soft x-rays, hard x-rays, um, and you can sort of see what kind of uh, magnetic, um, what kind of energies are, are being probed. In fact, the low end is probing weaker energies. It's coming from even just the magnetic field of the sort of nebular material um, around. Right, but that's not all that happens when you have these very fast moving electrons which are spiraling around field lines and things. So there's, there's the synchrotron, which we said, but there's also an inverse Compton scattering bit to the spectrum. So does anyone know what inverse Compton scattering is? Does anyone know what regular Compton scattering is? Yeah, and so typically, if I scatter some photons off some electrons, what normally happens? Um, so why is that? Exactly, right? So that's normal Compton scattering. I've got a photon, it's got some energy, interacts with the electron, gives some of its energy over to the electron. Inverse Compton scattering is the same thing, except it's called inverse because instead of giving up energy, the photon gains the energy. So here, you've got sort of possibly a thermal photon. And you've got some low energy photon coming. It encounters these electrons, which are moving at these relativistic speeds, spiraling around the field line. It's upscattered by that interaction. The electrons give up some of their energy to the photon. And the photons come out with these really high energies, providing this inverse Compton scattering at you know 10 to the 10 uh, 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 electron volts and higher. Um, and so that's where that's coming from, is this inverse Compton scattering process. Uh, and as we said, the reason for having these accelerated and highly relativistic electrons in the first place 
in order to provide beaming and all that, is the magnetic field. And it's sort of a two-part story. Remember, uh, the magnetic field, of course, is responsible for trapping these charged particles onto these spirally paths, but it's also responsible for freeing them in the first place. Right? Because if we have this changing magnetic field, this rotating magnetic field, we saw last time that that induces a potential difference across the surface of that neutron star, which imparts quite a lot of energy, able to free up these charged particles off the surface of the neutron star and get them moving. Okay. So then the next question that we addressed we started to think about was where does the magnetic field come from? Why does a neutron star have a very large magnetic field? So who remembers that? All right, so we're going to have a, a primordial sort of field at formation present in the star, and then that, as the star contracts because of flux freezing, intensifies the magnetic field. And that was certainly sort of this standard um, idea. And in particular then, the question sort of is just pushed back to where does it come from in stars? Well, in stars, when they're forming, we know they have convective zones, which means there's flow of charges. So you can go ahead and create there's this definite dynamo effect. You can create some magnetic fields from those convective zones. And then the thing about stars is, right, that they have convective zones and they have radiative zones depending on sort of density and conditions of how likely you are to scatter photons, or how easy it is to get them out and transfer, uh, you know, what's the most efficient way of transferring energy. And so if we look at sort of the formation of the lower mass neutron stars, and even thinking about perhaps white dwarfs forming, i.e. stars that don't even go supernova to make a nice white dwarf at the end of their life, then we're talking about sort of lower mass progenitor stars, and those guys have fairly small, and you can see sort of the representation there, um, uh, of convective regions. So the lowest mass star is kind of, again, all convective. Um, the medium mass star has a bit of radiative zone in its center, and then some convective material. And something greater than sort of 1.5 solar masses has, again, a convective center and a radiative zone. And further, as you change things, and we'll see, it still changes how things behave inside the star. But the thing that we're interested in is this convective zone, because that's where we think we're really getting the dynamo. So if we have a star where the convective zone is sort of large enough that it will contribute a significant fraction of the stars, of this neutron star's final mass, or possibly of the white dwarf's final mass, then we can see that we would have that magnetic field, at least initially, to then go ahead and pretend that we have the flux freezing and we can preserve that field when we make the neutron star and in fact allow it to strengthen as it contracts down. And part of the thing that goes on with this story though is this idea of, well, if a star is sort of generating it in its center, um, then we have these outer layers which can actually sort of screen off the magnetic field. And so you sort of need the so-called magnetic striptease effect to actually get the magnetic field um, to be seen at the end. Because if you have a significant amount of your radiative zone, which is kind of not really helping you do anything with the magnetic field, and you contract that down, then that's going to still be there kind of screening off the magnetic field in the uh, what was once the convective core. And so we need to go ahead and get rid of most of that radiative zone in order to leave us with basically a core of magnetized material from this convective zone um, showing up. And so indeed some white dwarfs uh, tend not to be, in fact most white dwarfs tend not to be uh, strongly magnetized because we think they sort of just haven't had much of a convective core um, that actually sticks around and collapses and gives rise to any sort of magnetic field. Uh, or put another way, that they do have a significant amount of what was formerly radiative zone material kind of screening off what was going on in the convective core. Right. And there's a little bit of um, variation in that story too, because as the star is even being born, 
it goes through phases of having convective or radiative pores. And during those phases, it can even do something exciting, like flip the direction of the magnetic field, um, such as happened in this one particular stop. Right. And you could trace sort of the evolution, right? You know, um, this HR diagram stuff, you know that you can show how stars are sort of born and approach onto the zero age main sequence. Well, in each part of that uh, process, there's kind of regions that define where you would have basically an overall convective star. That's the red region where you're just being born initially. And you've got the whole star basically being a convective zone. So you can really get a dynamo going. Then you have the core becoming radiative as the things uh, start to um, to reach that condition. So the photon transport of energy is much more effective in those inner regions. So then you settle down, you lose that convective motion in the core. You're left to deal with whatever magnetic field sort of was um, present, as well as kind of trying to maintain the external field as best you can. And then you've got this convective shell. As you then approach the zero age main sequence, you find that the whole star becomes sort of transparent uh, to photons, and photon transport of energy is much more effective. So then you kind of lose all of your churning for a little bit. And then uh, you're entirely basically reliant on any leftover overall rotation of the star, as well as um, the sort of remnant magnetic field that your convective zone originally created. And then, as you really start to turn back into, um, or you know, you're really turning into a star at that point, instead of a protostar, then, of course, you start putting out a lot more energy. Things change again as you've contracted down in order to ignite fusion. And photon transport is, again, less efficient, and you start creating that convective core again. And at that point, you can then uh, even, you know, you, you've got convection again, which can drive some more dynamo action and power you, uh, in terms of a magnetic field, drive that magnetic field back up again. And um, for interesting things like where you can sort of switch the direction, right, uh, if you're going from an all radiative to something which is going to have a convective core, if for whatever reason your convective core kind of starts cycling the other direction, then the magnetic field that you're going to start contributing will be opposite to the sort of original frozen in one. And so you could go ahead and flip the direction altogether during that process. And indeed, that is where this uh, particular star is located. It's somewhere in the transition from the blue region, label 3, to the final sort of birth part where you're labeled four and you're getting your convective zone going again. All right. So, okay, was there any other way in which a neutron star, aside from these primordial ones, could have had a magnetic field? Yeah. So remember, we discussed this idea, and quite possibly, this superfluid, this neutron uh, C, could in fact have some sort of convective motion, or something which gives rise to a dynamo, and then it can really ramp up the magnetic field. What happened when we did that? Magnetars. Yeah, we got some magnetars, right? So we've already seen that really the story of pulsars has at least one other variant which are magnetars, and we'll come back to that idea either at the end of this lecture or next time to see that, in fact, there's quite a variety of types of objects that you end up creating, even though sort of the story seems pretty straightforward, collapse down, make neutrons, and then call it done. But there's quite a lot that goes on, and you can get quite a lot of variety out. All right, so we can have some magnetars. And then, you know, we started thinking about, well, even if I take that spectrum that shows me the synchrotron emission, that shows me even the inverse Compton emission, and I'm talking about how much energy did I lose from my rotation, then I can estimate, you know, how much I should be seeing and take what I actually do see 
and I realized that I'm missing quite a bit. And so we had this idea that, okay, they have to also be powering some nice pulsar wind nebulae, um, and those winds uh, were carrying away sort of the rest of that energy. And so then we talked about really sort of how it works, um, and I just kind of wanted to say that again. So remember that what we have is rotating uh, neutron star sitting there. Along here is its magnetic field, these little loops. These guys are closed lines. These guys are open field lines. And then right through the pole is where we got some of that beaming of the radio beam, the radio emission from the synchrotron. But what else was going on? Well, we talked about the fact that really these charged particles are all spiraling around the field lines. And if they're kind of stuck with the field lines and the whole thing is rotating, then at some distance, because these are all trying to rotate with the same sort of angular rate, but the radius is increasing, that tangential velocity is increasing. And if you let it keep doing that, you get to somewhere where the velocity should be the speed of light. So that defined this light cylinder, which was talking about then saying that technically a particle here would have to rotate at the speed of light in order to sort of keep up with the neutron star. And that kind of defined where the last closed field line was. And as a result then, all the rest of the field lines that extended further out had to really be open and then weren't allowed really to close back up. Which also then means that the particles on those field lines can just stream away from the neutron star. All right. And um, just as a quick mention, uh, there's also these regions where you're sort of interacting right with all the particles that are moving and you can get gamma ray emission. Um, so that's a high energy emission that you can get through inverse Compton scattering and, and the like. All right. And so that's sort of all I wanted to say about here. But well, you're getting this wind because you've got particles streaming along these open field lines out basically. So then what's going on with the wind? Well, the wind is sort of spherically symmetric coming off a neutron star. So we'll put our pulsar wind in the center, uh, a pulsar in the center. Then we'll have some wind coming off that star, blowing out. And remember, all of that was sitting inside, really, that supernova explosion. So you had the forward shock from your supernova, and you had sort of a reverse shock coming back. And inside that was all this stuff about what happens with the wind. And we talked about how initially the wind can just kind of free stream because the shocks, the, the supernova shocks, have carried away most of the material. So this part is very low density material. So you're just kind of picking it up, moving it aside without too much effort. You're not really losing energy, and the wind just expands. But then, as you sort of get nearer and nearer to trying to push into that reverse shock coming from the supernova explosion, then we started really seeing some pressure. And so as we tried to keep moving, we sort of had the neutron star moving nicely. It keeps trying to put out the wind, but now it's pushing in to this shocked material, which is dense, which is resisting the wind. And so the wind just kind of ends up falling behind because you have sort of the original guy still expanding into the low density material but the rest of it is running into that shock material and so we were creating these bow shocks and things and leaving our pulsar um, sort of stripped of its wind having the wind all sort of behind it right and so that is also uh, shown here and just as another sort of representation, again, what's going on? The pulsar is moving. It's blowing out its wind. It's got this sort of um, termination shock as it encounters the reverse shocked material, the contact discontinuity, and then the overall bow shock. Okay. Now, suppose that you wanted to then ask the question, how big should my pulsar be? Uh, wind nebula B. Well, what's going on? I'm giving it energy 
which is basically coming from the fact that my pulsar is spinning down, right? We already said that. And what is the wind doing? What's the problem? What's limiting its size? Yeah, it's picking up all this material and encountering this reverse shock, this dense material that it then needs to try to blow out of the way. So, in order to think about what the size is going to be, I sort of have to balance those pressures. There's a pressure coming out from the wind, and I want that to sort of equal the pressure of this reverse shock. Alright, so how might we think about the pressure that is coming from the wind? What kind of pressure can the wind sustain? And in particular, I mean, the answer's on the slide there. But how could we maybe motivate that? So what is a pressure? Force per unit area. Force per unit area. All right. So that's a good start. And what is, then, energy? Well, kind of, right? I mean, the easiest way to say it is work, which is the same unit, is force times the distance. And that gives us an energy. What is a power? Yeah, energy per unit time. So, at that point, we sort of have a force times a velocity gives us a power, right? Okay, so if we wanted to talk about a force per unit area, we could take a power divided by area divided by velocity. Okay, and so <coughs> that sort of motivates what we've done there. We said then the pressure from this wind is going to be that spin down luminosity, that rate of energy loss, that power that's going into the wind, divided by 4 pi r squared c. Okay, 4 pi r squared is the surface area over which I'm spreading the wind. And so that sort of makes sense. So we've assumed we've got this nice spherical, spherically symmetric wind, which of course is not right, because we know we have the bow shock and all that going on. But as a first go, it's a fair estimate. All right, so that's where that's coming from. You can just estimate it based on that. And then certainly the sort of really obvious conceptual statement to make at that point is that the properties of our pulsar wind nebula are going to really be determined by the composition and geometry of the wind, right? Because that goes into that sort of area factor. The composition will tell you sort of about um, really uh, what's in the wind carrying away this energy and how likely it is to interact or not interact with whatever it is that you're pushing into. And of course, then certainly you also need to think about what it is you're pushing into because the other half of that equation is the pressure that that reverse shocked material um, is exerting. All right. Um, and then, so just through that discussion, you realize that what happens is you've got a nice supernova remnant, and then somewhere off the center is the actual um, enlarged area here. You see the sort of the neutron star and its wind also a wind nebula lagging behind it. Anybody know or can think of a good conceptual reason why the neutron star is moving in its supernova remnant? It's the center of the neutron star. Yeah, but so why wouldn't that sort of have the same motion after the explosion of the neutron star. Right, it's all material that sort of came from the neutron star. And it's centered on the neutron star. So what would make them then kind of disconnect and have different velocities? Well, I mean, you... You, you could, if you're talking about conservation of angular momentum, then that's all right. And then if you're talking about saying um, that you're also conserving momentum as 
the supernova shock sweeps out some ISM, well then it should certainly slow down, but why wouldn't it be still centered on the neutron star? Like it's still a nice sphere, so it's not it's not like the wind where it's been distorted and turned into this weird bow shocked material. So it's not that sort of I was had the sphere which was trying to move, and then the leading edge was smacking into ISM, and then it distorted the whole thing. It's still a sort of nice spherical thing, more or less. But the neutron star has clearly gotten far away from, I don't know, that looks about center, and it's way down there. So in fact, the fact that this is a sphere tells me that that's probably more or less moving with whatever the explosion originally was doing. Sort of. What needs to be specifically happening as it loses mass? Well, so it'll increase its velocity in some sense, but why? Like if I, if I have an object and I were to quite really, if I assume that I'm exactly making a beautiful spherically symmetric explosion and I throw mass out in every direction, then momentum's conserved automatically, right? And I can just sit at the center of that. So what must be true? Exactly. So there had to be some asymmetric aspect of the explosion for some reason or other which actually imparts a kick to the neutron star during its birth. So that then it becomes disconnected from that more or less spherically symmetric expanding nebula of material. Okay. So there is some asymmetric thing that happens in these explosions and gives rise to the fact that the neutron star will move throughout the center, uh, throughout maybe its um, supernova remnant. Okay, and the wind encounters the reverse shock and gets bow shocked and does all that. So then the core little neutron star is no longer even at the center of its pulsar wind nebula. Okay. All right, now this is something we haven't yet talked about. Where do you think we would actually find pulsar? Excellent. So why? Yeah, that's where you have sort of the most material. And we want massive stars in order to make it go supernova. So wherever you have sort of the most star formation is where you expect to find most of these pulsars. And indeed, if we take a survey, most of them are found in the galactic plane, which is where we have all the gas and dust, or, well, most of it for our galaxy. All right. So, good. And there's another comment. There's this small asymmetry in the explosion that can actually impart something like 1,000 kilometer per second velocities to these pulsars. And so they can quickly move away from the center of, the, um, of those guys. And indeed, with that kick, they can kind of move up and down out of the plane of the galaxy, too, if they are imparted in the right direction. All right. So then, what it is, what do we think about the um, structure of a neutron star? So we sort of talked about this in the tube. We showed that it couldn't just be sort of all neutrons. And basically, we also, we also saw that sort of the density increases as you get towards the core, which makes sense because you've got more material sitting on top of you. And so there's this idea that basically you do have sort of neutrons um, mostly, but you still have some electrons and some general nucleons, and in fact on the very surface we know we had to have ions and electrons because those are the guys that are being accelerated and then giving us that synchrotron emission. And so those guys are sitting sort of at the surface. And further in, it's becoming more and more neutrons. As you continue to increase the pressure or uh, sort of the gravitational force going deeper and deeper, well, what's going on is some of those electrons are combining with the protons, making more neutrons. Then 
And you actually get into these weird sort of states of neutron, proton, Fermi liquid, some electrons still present, and then who knows, maybe in the center you actually collapse your neutrons a bit and are actually reduced to looking at balls of quarks, um, sort of still loosely bound, but not quite really into um, you know, sort of the normal way. And maybe some gluons are present. We're not really sure. Um, the generic kind of description of what all those components really look like is that the crust is basically modeled to be some sort of crystalline solid object. So it's a real solid surface. And then we think basically everything else inside is pretty much like a liquid um, or possibly a superfluid, in fact. And the outer crust is basically the material that is sort of regular star material or dead star material, so things that make up the outer layers of a white dwarf. So probably iron-rich nuclei, um, and then some degenerate electrons, right? Because the white dwarf in the end is supported by electron degeneracy pressure. Um, and then when you overcome that, that's why you get the type 1a at a very fixed mass. Um, but uh, then as we sort of go inwards, we start getting more and more neutrons, as we said. Um, so that's because the electrons are finally being forced into uh, the nucleus, basically, where they combine with the proton to make more neutrons. And that sort of decreases that uh, degeneracy pressure, allowing you to then keep cramming more and more in to so get rid of that electron degeneracy pressure. So then the uh, density can rise quite a bit. Um, then yeah, as density increases, uh, you find that any massive nuclei which we said were present on the surface, begin to become massively unstable. Um, and so they quickly release neutrons as they decay down. And then as you still go further and further, while the neutron fluid pressure just increases with density, because you've got sort of this neutron uh, degeneracy pressure pushing out. So then within one to nine kilometers of the center, all the neutrons are basically in this superfluid state. And there's also some superfluid, um, superconducting protons and electrons present. That is the region that we think really maintains the B field. Right? And remember, that's also sort of if we had a dynamo, that's where we think it would be, in the superfluid part. Um, remember, that also only lasts for well, 10 seconds or whatever it was. Um, during the actual initial formation of the neutron star, then everything kind of settles into a sort of steady state with that slow spin down. And then um, yeah, near the inner crust, we also think that there's sort of this interaction between the fluid and the crust, where occasionally some of that superfluid uh, kind of leaks out up into the lattice of the solid structure of the crust and basically gives it a little bit of a jolt making it spin up a little bit because the core is sort of spinning faster as a superfluid the surface might be lagging and then if it kind of leaches into cavities in the um, lattice that makes up the solid crust then I can sort of grab it and spin it up and so this gives rise to what are called glitches and we'll talk a little bit more about them in a little bit um, all right and then there's the core, which is the inner one kilometer. It has a density of something like 10 to the 18th kilograms per meter cubed. What is it really made of? We don't know. It could be uh, maybe some sort of really highly densely packed neutron object. Or it could be that those neutrons break down into sort of quark matter, um, which still overall tries to screen off its color, but is now really uh, sort of more squashed than the quarks that make up a neutron. And then it could be, in fact, that they are squeezed into making some pions, right, which is certainly possible because you have a whole bunch of up and down quarks. If you wanted to squeeze them kind of close together, the simplest thing to do would be to start making collections of two instead of three. So you waste less space in the sort of bonds between them. And so maybe that's what's going on. 
Right, and then here is just yet another sort of overall representation with slightly different terminology that you may hear. So at this point, there's core, mantle, inner crust, outer crust, technically what people call an ocean, and then even something that you could call an atmosphere. That's just trying to make it a bit more like planets. In that case, the atmosphere is where you're getting your ions from. The ocean is where you start getting these sort of liquid properties, really. Um, and then the crust, mantle, and that sort of thing is where it's really um, more neutron starish than anything else, and you have a whole bunch of neutrons dominating, um, as opposed to having the nuclei uh, sort of at the outer crust ocean uh, edges. Right. And just a quick word on degeneracy pressure. So, uh, what is degeneracy pressure? Yeah, so you can't, you can't possibly squeeze them into the same state. So that means that unfortunately you can't put everything in the ground state. You have to actually start filling in higher and higher energy levels, which amounts to, if you think about electrons orbiting around um, an iron nucleus, it amounts to puffing out the atom, because each energy level has a larger and larger radius. And so that electron, <coughs> that electron degeneracy pressure is sort of easy to understand in that sense. But the same thing happens also for neutrons, right? They're also fermions. You can't slap them infinitely many into the same state. So they all become sort of pairing, and then the next batch has to have that higher energy state. And so you get this outward push because you cannot put everything into the same state. And that's what's going on with the neutrons. Um, and what is sort of one nice or sort of interesting feature about degeneracy pressure as opposed to things like the normal atmospheric pressure or thing, or even the pressure that kind of supports stars. It's a big difference. If I increase the temperature, what happens to like the pressure of a gas? Yeah, whereas if I change the temperature of a degenerate fluid, have I done anything to its degeneracy pressure? No, right? That's just talking about quantum states, how closely you can pack them. So that's why we get this sort of nice, interesting um, difference, and why you can get these sort of runaway energy effects that then result in massive explosions when you finally pile on enough that the degeneracy pressure is overcome. Because by that point, you've also increased the temperature to ridiculously high values. All right, so then I mentioned this thing about pulsar glitches. Well, pulsar glitches are, if you go with the standard story, we said, well, you've got this pulsar, it's got some period, and the period is changing with time, but at a very steady and slow rate, All right, 10 to the minus 13 seconds per second, kind of typical spin uh, P dot. And so what that means is that the period is slowly increasing as this um, neutron star is slowly spinning down. So you can sit there and, you know, we said you can set your clock by the regular pulses. You can measure how that period is really changing. And what you'll see is that for the most of the time, the pulsar is behaving nicely. It's got that standard P dot kind of value. But then, Occasionally, you might see something like that, where all of a sudden, the pulsar spins faster, right? The period decreases, so it's spinning faster. And then it just kind of magically seems to settle down again and have the same sort of slope, but now it's been shifted because you had that glitch. So it just kind of settles back to that normal spin down rate. And these things are unpredictable. They are sort of a 10 to the minus fifth kind of size change in the um, uh, period. So that's 10 to the minus 3% change in the period. But it is something that's quite noticeable against that 10 to the minus 13th kind of change, or 10 to the minus 10 factor, really, because we're talking about millisecond pulsars, so get rid of factor 3, right? This is many orders of magnitude larger change than anything that we're talking about with P dot. 
which is why you have this nice slope, which is p dot, and then you have this sudden jump. So why might that happen? Um, so, yeah, that's an interesting idea that maybe some sort of weird magnetic activity has occurred where you might perhaps done something like on the sun where you get sort of reconnection events that then shoot out uh, material. And so if we did sort of break and reconnect our field lines, then we can get rid of some of that breaking effect, right, which we talked about that we're frozen into this material which is out there spinning slower. So that's actually a really good idea. What else might do it? Yeah. So there's certainly that idea that maybe there's some sort of interaction between the superfluid, which could maybe be spinning sort of faster, and uh, this core of the crust, rather has sort of lagged a little bit behind as it spins down and then it just quickly gets a kick by finally catching a little wave so to speak and that kind of uh, spins it up so that's something that could happen and what else might you think could be happening? Uh, could be but then Sort of, if you're losing mass, you're more likely to be carrying away angular momentum than gaining it. So, okay, maybe, yeah, something falls in on it and spins it up. But, you know, you could calculate the fraction of mass that you'd have to either e eject or e absorb to quickly do that larger change in your angular momentum. And this guy is, you know, spinning really fast and is really massive. So you need a pretty massive chunk of an asteroid type something crashing in which you would be also wondering where it came from because you've just gone supernova and blasted everything away but that there that's a possible um, idea but then you would really expect that these are ridiculously rare events right. so if they're not really rare events we've got the magnetic field theory we've got the inner fluid theory what else could you think about if you have a solid crust what could be going on? In particular, I've got something which is rotating really, really rapidly. So what sort of shape would that object have? Yeah, it would be a kind of oblate, ellipsy thing spread out yeah, along uh, sort of perpendicular to the rotation axis. And I've said the thing is kind of a solid crust. So that's fine when it starts off. I form the star I make my nice solid crust, get my lattice structure in place in this weird ellipsoid shape. And then I let the pulsar evolve. The pulsar is spinning down. If it's spinning down, what might happen to that solid crust? Yeah. It, it is no longer really supported against that collapse by the rotation anymore. So if it's not too strong, it could fracture, re-make itself into this more spherical shape corresponding to the new rate of rotation. And why does that matter? It can change the moment of the of the Exactly, right? I've brought mass closer to the center by making it more spherical, or closer to the axis of rotation which has decreased the moment of inertia. I haven't exerted any torque on the system, and therefore I have to conserve angular momentum. Moment of inertia went down. My angular rotation has to go up. All right, so those are some good ideas uh, for how we might get glitches. So it would have had an oblate shape, and it slows. The crust wants to be more spherical, so the crust will break up to make that transition.
when it reforms, the angular momentum was conserved. The radius is smaller, moment of inertia is smaller. The rate of rotation has to increase. So you get that spin up. So that's one. The superfluid is another. The magnetic fields is another. Um, good idea. Uh, we don't really know what's going on there. Although the star quakes, it's been sort of disfavored. So the star quakes are this idea of the cross preforming because it doesn't seem to have sort of a large enough effect. Uh, so probably it might be the superfluid theory that's gaining prevalence. Um, although some exotic magnetic events could also be possibly doing that. So then, um, just really quickly, I want to talk about sort of the cousins of neutron stars, which are white dwarfs. Um, and so if you're not massive enough, right, for the supernova explosion, then you just become a white dwarf, which is just this exposed core of a star, because you still puff off your outer layers in the wind. And they're supported by electron degeneracy pressure. So some of their properties could be similar to neutron stars. And indeed, if we look at them, they sort of are. Um, because you can get, although the majority of them are sort of really low mass and have come from low mass stars, so they don't have much of a magnetic field um, in the star, and they incorporate a lot of the radiative zone material, those neutron stars tend to not have much magnetic field. But something like 5% of them can, in fact, have a little bit of a magnetic field somewhere in the range 10 to the 5th, 10 to the 9th Gauss. Um, which, if you then were to compress that down to a neutron <coughs> star, actually would give you the sort of um, magnetic fields that we know that neutron stars have. So quite possibly, these are sort of really the borderline white dwarfs, um, which had they been just slightly more massive, would have gone ahead, made neutron stars, and really just done that sort of fossil compression of the magnetic field to give rise to the proper neutron star magnetic fields. Um, and as we said, there's sort of different masses. The non-magnetic ones tend to be the lighter ones. The magnetic ones tend to be the more massive ones. Although only something like 25% of the ultra-massive white dwarfs, white dwarfs which are past one solar mass, uh, only something like 25% of them seem to actually be magnetic. So there's a bit more to the story of exactly whether or not um, you become magnetic other than just the mass of the progenitor star. Um, and there's sort of a uh, thing to note that, of course, you would expect that even at this point you would see some of this rotational story happening, and indeed the white dwarves have similar kind of things of fairly fast rotations, um, and uh, there's sort of some which are non-variable, so sort of stable periods, and there are some which are actually variable in their periods. Um, and it's sort of interesting that the variable ones, which have ranges 12 minutes to 18 days a period, would, if you compress them down, seem to give the right periods of rotation for um, neutron stars. But these are the ones that are sort of really variable, whereas the neutron star is going to be really stable. Right. But white dwarfs have some of the similar kind of features. Um, yeah, we'll just stop there and then talk about the